know, I make these videos, I make them for people that I care about. I don't go back and check to see how many people go watch my videos. Sometimes when I'll be uploading, I'll go be checking on the progress and I'll, I'll notice something, you know, and, but I try not to feed my ego with that because this isn't about ego and it isn't also just about helping people. It's about catharticism. This is about getting this out and me, you know, feeling freer to know that the, you know, hopefully the people that, that I'm trying to be friends with now can truly know me and accept me for who I am. And I've never had that. You know, all my behavior problems always get in the way and misunderstandings and, you know, and, and I'm in a point in my life now to where I'm more self-aware and I've come so far in my healing. So I make these videos to, in hopes that it will help me grow a deeper sense of connection with people, something I don't have. Now, there are folks in my life because of the community garden that I've come to care about, care about deeply, and that's scary for me. And you all need to understand, I really, especially you folks who I'm working with, you really all need to know who I am and you need to understand my disorder better. So that's what I'm going to try to do tonight. And I'm going to be real vulnerable. And there's some new stuff that I've been working out trying to process that, you know, is really kind of sore point for me. And I'm still ashamed and living with a lot of guilt and regret over it. But I'm going to get into it tonight. I'm going to get into it because I think it's important. I feel like my father's calling me to speak now tonight about some important things. You know, I hear a lot of people talk about, oh, how I'm amazing and how good I am. And, you know, and a friend of mine told me I was a good and faithful, or, let's see, a good and obedient servant. That's the word she used. And, you know, that's not how I see things. And I think you're all wrong about that. And, and I'm, you know, and I tell y'all I'm harmless, you know, because I don't want y'all to be afraid of my mental illness. You know, I manage my mental illness well. I've come a long way. And let me tell you, I'm not harmless. I'm not completely safe. I'm dangerous. I'm dangerous just like anybody else is. I'm type 1 bipolar disorder, manic, by the way. We are at three times higher rate of violence than the average person. You know, I am that person. I do have rage. You know, I you know I don't go around hurting people. I have a, a high moral code and deep empathy, and I want to get into all that. The why, why you can trust me, you know. But the truth is, is I'm not safe. And I, when am I manic? And with my behaviors, I can be weak, and I can do things I shouldn't do. I can say things I shouldn't say. I can be unkind. I can be flirty. I can be very open and expressive about my my feelings in 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 things in in ways that make people uncomfortable and i will get into in explaining all that now i made a video not so long ago about hypersexuality and how it relates to you know type 1 bipolar disorder and as a side note i'd also like to point out that you know, it's not just hypersexuality that comes with this. It's also hyposexuality to where you get to a point where the idea of sex is like, you know, disgusting to you and it just feels, makes you feel dirty and, you know, like it's guilty and it's just, a, it's, it's the opposite. And, and then when you're in a marriage, you have to live with that. It isn't just the hypersexuality that your partner has to deal with. It's the hyposexuality and it, that back and forth is terrible, terrible and difficult on marriages you know and well I was researching the hypersexuality and I was watching a video on YouTube from bipolar warriors and he was talking about you know a very very frank conversation to be honest with you about hypersexuality and uh, not one I would personally feel so comfortable being so frank about but one thing he did bring up was fixation he, that word fixation and it really hit me hard and that's that sore point that I've got to get into tonight, you know, about how I have that problem with fixation and it's, not, it's, it's things and people, right. You know, and, uh, now I haven't fixated, you know, like, you know, really hard on anybody as a person in years. I fixate on gardening mostly these days, 
you know, now, but I do have a story that I have to share with you from when I was younger and I did fixate and it, you know, got a little pretty creepy for a minute. I understand that, you know, that folks that have this mania, this issue like me, you know, and we, we tend to fixate, you know, that's the word they use. And, and, you know, and, and what that means is like, what it can mean is like, this is when you find the people that are, you know, looking in their ex's windows and stalking them and, you know, it gets really creepy and scary. And then if you're the wrong kind of guy that you have the right kind of personality, like on the sociopathy side of the spectrum, then, you know, those people can get hurt, you know, and, you know, and bad things happen, you know, and so fixation is a serious, you know, behavior problem with this issue. And I have had problems with fixation in the past and didn't even understand it. Now, I have creeped out a few women, but, I, you know, I don't go around stalking people. I don't go around looking at people's windows. You know, I have, like I said, I have a high moral code. I always have, you know, you know, I just, I'm not that kind of person, you know, but I have like hard times letting go of feelings and relationships for people. That's where I fixate. You know, and uh, a story that it's very hard, very, very hard to tell this story. I'm ashamed of it. And I've only recently realized, you know, the, you know, seriousness of what, you know, I did, you know. Well, I was married young. I got married at 22 to a woman I didn't know very long at all, just a few months. That's, I'm impulsive. That's part of my disorder. And by the way, I believe she had some of these similar issues too, you know, but that's not for me to get into, but, but, you know, we were married for a year and we had a kid together, you know, and she started fooling around on me and running around and I was with home with the kid and then, you know, she, you know, was unhappy and she kicked me out, you know, she took me to my friend's house and I didn't, you know, and dropped me off and I, got out of the military. I was supposed to be going to college. She wouldn't go with me to college, so I didn't have a job. I didn't have a place to stay. She dropped me off at my friend's house. You know, nothing, you know, no money, nothing, except my, the clothes on my back, right? You know, and I was really upset, you know, and, you know, a couple nights after that, I had one of my friends drop me off at their house out in the country where she, you know, she lived with her family, now, I lived with her for a year, you know, well, six months, something like that there. But she lived with me in New York in the Air Force. We've been together for like a year and a half. And, well, there was nobody home. And I didn't think about it as if I was, you know, an outsider and like I was. And, you know, we, we always we had a patch of screen on the porch that we would pull back and reach in and open the door and let ourselves in you know, to the house, you know, and I can't remember all the details, but I just remember doing that, pulling the screen back. And I went in and I sat down and I waited for her to come home until the next morning. And she came home and she had a bar stamp on her hand because she was underage and she was out with a guy, you know, and, you know, of course I was terribly upset and she was upset that I was sitting in there in a the house waiting on her, of course, you know, and, you know, and I felt like, you know, that was my wife, you know, and looking back now, after I realized that, you know, how I fixate, I can fixate on it is that, you know, I feel that, you know, that was really wrong of me. That was really creepy, you know, and that was a case where I let my bipolar disorder get the best of me. And I, I scared my ex-wife, you know, even, you know, it doesn't matter what she was doing, you know, what is it doing? We were young, you know, and that's not even in my heart now to worry about that but but it is in my heart that you know I feel that you know people have noticed that behavior in me and like there's been times where like I had a girlfriend in Iceland that I had a really hard time letting go of and I'd be knock on our door at all hours of the night you know and you know wouldn't let things go I don't let things go very easy you know and at least I didn't in the past now you know I haven't really had any type of experience with it. I've been married for 26 years, you know, and I really haven't had that kind of experience, you know, and so, 
you know, most of my fixation has been like on video gaming. And then I couldn't, I don't play video games no more. I don't have any attention for that. I got into gardening, big a computer, you know, in my computer engineering. I fixate on things, obsess. And you probably all see that, how I fixate and obsess on things. You know, and, you know, but, you know, I hope my friends don't, you know, think too much less of me because, you know, I have these kind of issues, but, you know, you, you can be assured that I've worked really hard to learn controls and to learn how to manage those things, you know, so, or at least, you know, I'm beginning to learn. I've been learning for about a year now that I've been aware of all of it. Now, I've been in isolation for, it have been three and a half years where I kept my, you know, interactions with people to a minimum I wouldn't even interact with people in Walmart if I could help it you know but you know I would talk to people if I had to you know but you know I really did it was just a very rare thing for me to have any type of interaction with anyone other than my wife you know and and I realized now that a lot of that was me trying to you know minimize all this pain that I was creating for others and also that I was feeling by doing so because I'm this deep empath, you'll see I'm the extreme altruist, you know, and as I've talked about, you know, well, when I began being around people again, it was really crazy. This just beautiful, wonderful woman came to see me at my garden, you know, and I don't know, even know how she found me, you know, but, you know, my, my name gets around and all, and she came over to check out my garden and, and we had this, just this amazing experience in a garden and I hadn't even didn't even know this woman it was like an, an immediate connection right you know it's like she got what I was trying to do and you know and she you know and she felt it right you know now you know of course you know I hadn't felt that in t decades you know my my wife and I have not had ever really had that type of relationship you know but you know for five six seven years eight years you know, even touch has become, you know, something, you know, I don't get hugs, I don't get, I don't cuddle, I don't get, you know, kisses or affection, it's just, that's, you know, it's not there, you know. So, when this woman began, you know, making me feel really good, my feelings got real confused real fast. Remember, I told you that I can fixate, and I had not had that type of, you know, challenge in 20, I didn't even in 20 something years and did not even realize that it was a challenge this was all you know an eye opening experience and i did kind of fixate on her a little bit she kind of like you know i was infatuated with her you know and, but you know not in a serious way like i was stalking her or i wasn't i don't i hope i wasn't i don't think i was being creepy like that maybe i was being a little creepy you know because of my feelings are all up in things and i talk deeply and sincerely you know, and, you know, and that's not easy for most folks to take, you know, not, you know, I, it was a really good thing for it to happen, you know, because, you know, it was in a safe manner with someone that is a very, very good friend of mine to this day. I care. I love her very much, you know, and I'm, in, you know, no way, you know, uh, I don't know what the word, I'm not, you know, like pursuing anyone. I'm not chasing any tail anywhere. That's not what any of this is about. It was about feeling wanted, feeling desired, right? Feeling it's like somebody gets me connected, right? That's what I don't get. And that's what, you know, I fixated on, you know, and, you know, and I worked through it, you know, and realized what was going on and I've come a long way, and now I feel like I have the tools to manage these kind of problems with this fixation thing, you know, but that happened last summer, you know, and at the same time, you know, I wasn't getting what I felt I needed from my wife, so I told my wife that I was going to go start talking to other women, that I had to figure this out, you know, and that, you know, broke my wife's heart, I was, it was unkind to me, I feel, you know, but I did, I began talking to a woman on the internet on Instagram and it was really crazy because I really you know felt like we were kind of drawn to each oh, I was drawn to her and her story but I'm kind of a person that is drawn to people that need me right that you know I feel you know I need to be needed I guess you know 
and I felt like this woman did need me, you know, and I tried to lift her up and I, you know, we, and I got something from her, you know, I got that feeling of being wanted and, you know, she thought I was sexy and attractive. It just, it was like being young again. It was just that drug rush, dopamine rush, like feeling, you know, and it really is a lot like that. It's like chasing that dopamine dragon, right? You know, that feel good chemical. Well, it got to be, I think, you know, where, she, you know, her head got up in it and she gave me the brush off and, you know, and she set me up to, you know, really be looking forward to our talk that one, one night. And then she didn't show up and it kind of broke my heart, you know. And so I realized, you know, I realized that, you know, she was trying to hurt me because, you know, I was, all these things I was saying, she'd never spoken with anyone like me. And I think she thought I was I was hurting her. I think it was like salt in a wound to her wounds. I, I, that's the only thing I get is that my me trying to be kind and loving was like actually toxic, toxic and hurtful. You know, so you know, I am not safe. You know, I'm, I'm not obedient. I'm not good. I do my best. I pray. I use mindfulness. I use prayer meditation and I trust my father and I try to listen to him and I know he speaks to me I know he speaks to me I hear him speak I, I trust in that you know and I'm getting better about it and I think because of that he's given me a lot of strength and fortitude in this battle and that I do believe I will be healed from my bipolar disorder I believe it I believe it it won't be that many years in the future this year this year I just you know, need my friends to know who I really am. No, I'm not completely safe and I'm not obedient. I'm not good. I've never been that. I'm just trying my best. Y'all got to know who I am. Now, if you ask folks about uh, sociopathy and psychopathy, it's called the antisocial personality disorder umbrella or spectrum. Right. You know, and that, you know, that can go from just having some empathy problems where you can't sympathize with people very much, but you're not a harm all the way through sociopathy, which is mostly considered to be a product of environment all the way up into psychopathy, which is considered to be genetic. Right. You know, now if, you know, if a lot of people just look at that side, but they don't realize that there's a polarity to all of this. There always is a duality and a polarity. And on the other end of the spectrum is the extreme altruist, the empath, the hyper empathy syndrome. Right. And the extreme altruist and the sociopath and psychopath share personality traits. They have a lot of things in common, the both ends of the spectrum, and they're on the same spectrum. Now, of course, the extreme altruist is deeply empathetic and cares about people, but much of his empathy is toxic, and it's not necessarily all a positive, good thing, you know, and, and so people get hurt still, you know, and, and, and the question's got to be is, does it really matter if there's a conscience involved or not when you're going around hurting people? You know, and so when we're talking about antisocial personality disorder, that we really have to look at it as, as that's just one polarity or one side of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum is empathy and extreme altruism. Now, what is extreme altruism? Now, when we're talking about hyper empathy, right, you know, we're talking about uh, something that is often a product of trauma. It is a trauma response. Now, not always is that true, but it is quite often a trauma response. Now, you'll see people that have hyper empathy. They're super generous, right? They go way out of their way for their people. They'll do, you know, for, for strangers. They're, you know, they, you know, you guys have seen this in me. You know what I'm talking about, you know? And, and, and like what it says right here, and while this may not be true for everyone, the strong desire to be empathetic can be a trauma response. If your struggles were dismissed when you were growing up, you may overcompensate by paying extreme attention to other people's emotional states instead of your own. And that is exactly what I do and exactly why. 
because my struggles were dismissed. My mother allowed this man to do these terrible things. My friends allowed this to happen to me. The, the family allowed this stuff to happen to me, right? You know, and, and so I developed this hyper empathy. I became the extreme altruist, which is what happens, you know, because I had the genetics for it and I was placed under the influence of a psychopath who had the genetics on the other side of the spectrum. And, and, and what it did is it elicited this hyper empathetic response from me. If I've read an article in Scientific American a few years back, and it was talking about uh, the walking the line between good and evil, the common thread of heroes and villains. And they're talking about the genetic link between sociopathy, psychopathy, and the extreme altruism. We call the extreme altruism the ex-altruist. Now, the, and this is quoted right from the article. There is a genetic link between the ex-altruist and the psychopath. The same basic, basic set of extreme traits in each personality with a few important exceptions. One being expressed empathy. I will interject here and say that on antisocial personality disorder, we're talking in sociopathy, psychopathy being the extreme end of that side of the spectrum. It's called empathy deficiency. That is a, a term by doctors, by scientists. Empathy deficiency. Extreme altruists have way too much empathy. Now, that same article, behavior geneticist David Thorson Lichen wrote in his book, The Antisocial Personalities, when he said, the hero and the psychopath may be twigs on the same genetic branch. It is very possible that two members of the same family, even brothers, in a shared home environment, could end up as seemingly polar opposites, one doing extreme good, the ex-altruist the other doing extreme bad, the sociopath. You see, this is why I say that everything I went through in my life is because I have a purpose to serve in this world and that I'm here to change the world and that I do not feel any type of bitterness about the dark, evil things I had to suffer and endure under the hand of a psychopath. And people say, how can you feel that anymore? And I say, because... Were it not for that, I would not be the extreme altruist that I am today. And God made me to be the extreme altruist. And yes, I'm type 1 bipolar manic, right? And had I been not in his presence, I may have ended up being the sociopath. I may have expressed sociopathically. I really believe that. I believe that what I went through was so that I would be the ex-altruist. Now let's look at the traits that sociopaths and ex-altruists share. Now, the sociopath has low impulse control, high novelty-seeking needs, desire to experience new things, high need for arousal, shows no remorse for their actions, lack of conscience, no experience guilt, inability or unwillingness to see past own needs in order to understand how another feels, lack of exhibited empathy, detached emotionally from situations, personal relationships, willing to break rules, defy authority, always acts in the interest of himself in whatever fashion ultimately serves him best, selfish, self-protected, extremely fragile or unstable ego or self-identity, extreme emotional sensitivity. Now let's take a look at the ex-altruist. Once again, low impulse control. Once again, high novelty seeking needs, desire to experience new things, high need for arousal. Little remorse for their actions once again. While they may feel guilt over causing harm, they would still do the heroic act again in a heartbeat. Inability to see past the needs of others and experience, understand their pain. Very, very high exhibited empathy. Able to emotionally detach from situations temporarily when necessary, such as during a crisis, engages in flexible detachment. Willingness to break rules and a defy authority will redefine what the rule should be. Sounds familiar. 
acts in the best interest of others or to serve the common good because it, because it is the right thing to do. Selfless, put self in frequent danger during acts of heroism. Very resilient ego or able to repair ego quickly after damage or threats to identity. Ego resilience. Extreme emotional sensitivity. Just like the sociopath. Well, guys, I got to tell you. I've got low impulse control. I've got high novelty seeking needs. I have high exhibited empathy. I have little remorse for my actions uh, when I feel that they are for the common good. I detach emotionally from situations. I am definitely willing to break and defy rules. I act in the best interest of others and I do it all the time and everybody knows it. We can do things to help balance our empathy. I do try to do things to balance my empathy because it can be too much. It can become overwhelming. There is a well of suffering and sadness in the world and the bottom is out of sight and I have dived deep down in it and you can drown in this well of sadness. It's around you. It's inside you. It's everywhere. Everybody I bounce into, I sense it in them. It can be overwhelming and cause you to feel without hope. You have to protect yourself from that. That's why I went into isolation. That's why I have always dissociated from people. I can't help but believe that my father made me to be this way. And I don't think that I should have to go around trying to change who I am. I should just try to channel these behaviors in as constructive a way as possible. And I should try to find people, surround myself with people who can love and accept me for who I am. And who can accept big feelings. And who can accept the fact that I'm going to love them 100%, not 10%. And who can also help me draw boundaries when I need to. And who aren't afraid of me. But know that they have to respect my disorder and respect who I am. I'm not safe, but I'm also not dangerous to the people I love. But let someone try to hurt the people I love and see how fast I become dangerous. So you see, I am the extreme altruist. I am ex-altruist. Now, I won't say that I am all the way on the far end of the spectrum. You know, just like, you know, I don't, I, maybe I am. I mean, I, I've given away a lot. I've done a whole lot of things, you know, I, that, you know, other people would just think insane, you know, to help others, you know, and, but I'm definitely extremely altruistic. And I feel that 100% that that's because of what I went through and that my father being with me that, you know, and this deep sense of empathy is what makes me different. And yes, though I may fixate and yes, I, you know, and when I love my friends, I love my friends. I'm just, I mean, I'm telling you, I just don't know if my friends are going to be able to take it. And I expect that I won't be able to, I, how could I possibly keep all my friends, all of you? And I hope you all watch my video and you listen to this. And you know, like right now, you know, I have a couple friends in particular that I'm particularly fixating on. And that, you know, my heart is 100% focused on them, you know, and, and, I'm trying to keep my distance and give them space because I know how crossing boundaries that can be. Does that make sense? You know, like everything about who I am crosses boundaries. I'm too much. I've told people that I'm too much. I'm not feeling sorry for myself. I'm just telling you how it is. I'm too much for most people. It takes a special kind of person who can take it and take me. But I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's worth it because I've got a heart of gold and I would do anything. And man, I am the kind of friend that you can't find anywhere if you get me to be your friend. But let me tell you, it ain't easy. 
It ain't easy. Now, my friends at the community gardens has got my heart. You know, because they've, they've went out of their way for me. They've accepted me. They've made this possible for me to finally complete a 10-year dream. They got my heart. I hope they take the time to watch this.